Okay, so we were finishing the chapter about dimension. So we were talking about dimension and transcendence degree. So um, <clears throat> I don't maybe recall the definition of transcendence degree, which is relatively clear. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we had, uh, there was this alternative definition of the transcendence degree that, uh, so we wanted to prove the following theorem. So if X is a variety, then the dimension of x is equal to the transcendence degree. I don't even know how I denoted that. Of uh, the function field, the field of rational functions, over k. So the number of algebraically independent elements here. And we had known that, uh, <coughs> that these uh, Algebraically independent elements could be, can be taken as the class, you know, as a subset of the classes of the coordinates. For instance, if we are in a n, and we uh, so this we are about, we proved this uh, modulo the statement. So we so proved this uh, is uh, assuming the following uh, uh, theorem that uh, every variety is uh, birational to a hypersurface. Okay, and this is a somewhat surprising result because somehow one would think that varieties are much more general than just hypersurface, and they also are, but there's, there are open subsets which are isomorphic to open subsets of hypersurfaces always. Okay, and now we want to prove this theorem. So <coughs> first, so for simplicity, I will prove the theorem under the assumption that the characteristic of k is equal to zero. The proof that I will give can be modified to work for, work for any characteristic, but it's a bit more complicated. And so I will just, so for simplicity, assume so. <clears throat> I mean, this I use because I want to use the theorem of the primitive element. Now, um, uh, one can prove that in the situation where I am, the theorem of the primitive element can be applied. You need a, whatever, a separable field extension. And uh, the field extension we're looking at will be separable, but one would have to prove that. And I don't want to. And in characteristic zero, we know that all finite extensions are Separable, so that would be fine. So, <clears throat> so we have the theorem of the primitive element. So let uh, K be a field of characteristic zero. And let um, L over K be a finite field extension. Then there exists a primitive element. So then there exists, say, an element B in L such that L can be obtained by adding 
joining this single element B to K. Okay. And I expect to add this in the algebra course, so it's not. Uh, so now we want to use this to prove our theorem, this one. Ah, whatever, maybe it's um, two. So we have to somehow uh, make this hypersurface, no? We have to find the equation of a hypersurface. And we, uh, we do this by, um, <coughs> by using what we know about this transcendent spaces. So we say, so we have kx, the function field of x. And so let, say, x1 to xr be a transcendent spaces of kx over k. There is some transcendent spaces. We choose one. So then we know by the theorem that uh, I cited the other time that if I take kx over kx1 to xr is a finite algebraic extension. Oh, we had this theorem. If I have a finitely generated field extension of k and we divide by k adjoint uh, transcendent spaces, then the quotient, then this is a finite algebraic extension. So now we apply the theorem of the primitive element. So there exists one element which I have to join to, to this field so that it becomes kx. So there exists an element y in kx such that uh, kx, large kx, is equal to the small field kx1 to xr, and I join also y. And y is algebraic. over k x1 to xr. So if y is algebraic over k x1 to xr, that, I mean, there's a polynomial of which it is a zero. I can basically take the minimal polynomial of this. So thus, um, so there exists an irreducible polynomial uh, say f which with coefficients in this smaller field k x1 to xr with variables in a so a polynomial in x with coefficients in this field such that if I take f of my element y, this will be equal to 0. Why well, it's irreducible, so it's certainly not 0 anyway. OK. Now, <clears throat> we want to basically use this f to define uh, the hypersurface. So this is supposed to be finally the equation of, uh, of a variety which is birational to x. But in order to do this, 
you know, we cannot have it like this with coefficients in the field. We want to clear the denominators. No, this is, uh, so we know that kx1 to xr is isomorphic to the field of rational functions. So kx1 to xr is isomorphic, or I could also say is, the field of rational functions in variables x1 to xr. So I can write f See sum, whatever, over some finite sum over some else, uh, GL from x1 to xr divided by HL times x to the L, where the GI or the GL and the HL are some polynomials. Uh, coefficients in the small k in x1 to xr. No? Because we know the elements of this uh, uh, quotient field, uh, of this field of rational functions are just quotients of polynomials. Okay, so now we can clear the denominators. So, so multiply f uh, by product of the HL and divide afterwards by the uh, greatest common divisor of uh, the new coefficients. So after multiplying, I get some new coefficients of x to the l. I take the greatest common divisor. So then I, I in this way, I obtain a, a new polynomial. So in this way, you get uh, f, which is some polynomial in x1 to xr times uh, the original f which is equal to whatever g we we'll call it h tilde times f where h tilde is a polynomial in k x1 to xr and also f is a polynomial kx1 to xr and x. So we just have cleared the denominators. And I have, <coughs> and in fact, f is a primitive polynomial. So let's see. Um, I, I write it like this. I mean, I can, this is the same thing by definition of the polynomial ring, but I now, you know, the polynomial ring in R plus one variables is the same as the polynomial ring in R variables, as, as polynomials in X with coefficients polynomials in one variable less. But just, uh, if I view it now as a polynomial in X, it's, it's a primitive polynomial, because I've just said that I wanted the coefficients to be relatively prime, or divide by the greatest common divisor. and we know that uh, uh, if I take the original f, so the original f is irreducible in, uh, uh, you know, in, in this field. Therefore, also f itself, the small f, is irreducible in k as element in kx1 to xr comma x, because it's after all just the big F multiplied by a unit in this, uh, in this ring. No, it's just a constant from the viewpoint of, uh, of this. <coughs> and so by the Gauss lemma, uh, 
f is irreducible. As, as a polynomial in this ring. Okay, so we have this irreducible polynomial. I don't know whether so and now I want to say as I said, I want to take this polynomial, which is just a polynomial in r plus 1 variables. I want to take this as a, the polynomial which determines a hypersurface in a r plus 1. So let, let y be the zero set of f in a r plus 1. This is a hypersurface. It's an irreducible hypersurface. So it's a zero set of an irreducible polynomial. And if I look at the fu function field of y, what is it? It's the quotient field of this ring. So the field of rational functions. So. <clears throat> So this is, so we know if we take the, uh, how is it called, the uh, coordinate ring of y, this will be k x1 to xr x divided by the ideal generated by f. No? And so uh, the function field is the quotient field of that. Yeah. Indeed. And now, <clears throat> yeah, here I'm maybe a little bit fast, but um, so, so you could. <clears throat> I claim that this is the same as the function field of k x1 to xr and then like this. So you just have to see that <coughs> so you know, if you look the way this uh, equation works, you get, uh, you know, you have that this is somehow a finite extension, and therefore, if you take the quotient field, it doesn't, I mean, you just get this. Anyway, you can try to think about it. It's quite easy to see. And this is just equal to uh, what we had here. Our, I have unfortunately wiped it out, but we had seen that this was precisely, uh, this is nothing else as Q as K X1 to XR, a joint X divided by F, and this is precisely what we had gotten as uh, KX. Oh, if you remember, we had that K, kx was isomorphic to uh, kx1 to xr it joined some element y which was the uh, which was the zero of a polynomial uh, so a parallel here we have the f but i can replace uh, you know over this thing the difference between the small f and the big f is just a unit so i can also write f here so, and then it's precisely how we had given how it was given. And so we see that kx is equal to ky, so they are birational. So 
So it's a somewhat unexplicit proof because we don't actually see any open set which is isomorphic to any other open set. We just prove abstractly that uh, the function fields are isomorphic. And we also have not really explicitly done anything at all. We, we take this transcendence basis which exists by some general existence result. So somehow how you find this hypersurface which is birational to our given variety is completely mysterious from the proof. But anyway, we have proven that there is one. Okay. <coughs> it's um, <coughs> yeah, yeah. X is birational to Y. That's uh, you know, KX is equal to KY. No, KY is equal, and therefore X is birational to Y. Sorry. That's uh, you know, you know that uh, two varieties are birational if and only if their functional fields are isomorphic. Okay, so this proves this, uh, this result. We will also use it again later. I mean, this particular theorem. So either at the end of today's lecture, but that's slightly unlikely, more likely in the next lecture. So, uh, <clears throat> So with this, we actually finish uh, the story of dimension. So I had this, have this other definition of dimension. So one was with this chain of, of irreducible closed subsets. The other one was a with a transcendence degree. And we find that they are both the same. And so uh, and as I said, the transcendence degree, you really can think of it as somehow, in some sense, at least, you know, if you view this xi somehow as coordinates, so the, X, the transcendence basis, you can see how many coordinates you have in some sense locally on your variety. So that it has something to do with that. And the other definition is this other thing that each time you cut down by some equation, it gets, the dimension gets smaller by one. And then this way you see the dimension. So there's a, two quite different views on dimension which, are, uh, which turn out to give the same result. Okay. And... Uh, <clears throat> So now we want to talk about tangent space, uh, singular and non-singular points. So you know, if you have a manifold, then the manifold has a tangent space at every point. Um, and algebraic, and this tangent space has always the same dimension as the manifold. If you have a, an algebraic variety, it will have a tangent space. And this tangent space will not always have the same dimension depends on the point where you are, uh, which dimension it has. But there will be some open subset where the dimension will always be the same. And uh, where the dimension is actually of the tangent space is actually equal to the dimension of the manifold or of the variety. And uh, these are the non-singular points, so where the thing looks smooth. And the, where the dimension is different, of the tangent space is different from the dimension of the variety, these will be the singular points. And uh, it somehow also coincides, you know, when you see, if when you make a picture and you see something which looks singular, you will see that this actually is a singular point according to this definition. Okay, so let's see. I will, however, do this a bit slowly. First, I do it for hypersurfaces in AN, and then I do it for uh, fine varieties, and then I do it in general. So. So we, we start with the case of hypersurfaces in fine space. So singular and so case of hypersurfaces in AN. So, <clears throat> so first, so <clears throat> first I talk about the differential of a polynomial and I will use that to define what I want. 
so or rather partial derivatives. So let so if f is a polynomial in x1 to xn, we can consider uh, so we have <coughs> we can consider uh, the partial derivatives. df by dxi. Um, this would be also some polynomial. And you know, these are just, you compute them formally. No, it's not an analysis thing. You can do this over any, uh, any field. <coughs> so, so, if x is a zero set of f in an it's a hypersurface and we assume that the ideal of x uh, is equal to a deal generated by f so here I'm not assuming that f is irreducible. So if f is irreducible, for instance, the ideal of x is equal to, to that. But if it could be that x is reducible, but the fact that, that the ideal of x is equal to the ideal generated by f means that if you write it as a product of factors, no, none of the factors has a power in it. So, and, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, I assume so x is allowed to be reducible, but it must be that the ideal of x is just f. So a point p in x is called uh, a singular point Well. If all partial derivatives of f vanish at this point, so if and only if df by dxi at p is equal to zero for all i equals one to n. Okay, so if I have a point which lies in x, so f is zero there. And all partial derivatives are also zero. It's called a singular point. And otherwise, it's called a non-singular point. Maybe one says that the set of non-single points so at x rec is defined to be the set of all p in x. P is non-singular. So I want to stress one point. A, a singular point of x must be a point of x. Okay? It's not so it's not enough. So by definition. A singular point of x is a point of x. So the condition is not just that all partial derivatives are zero, but also f must be zero. So when I, in the homework and final uh, exam over the years, there was always somebody who got this wrong. So therefore, I, <laughs> I state it again explicitly. So a singular point of a variety is, in particular, a point of the variety. No. OK. And um, so example. So I just want to make some trivial examples. So first, so this condition that the ideal of x is f is somehow important for the. So, so uh, non-singular point is a regular point? 
Yeah, you can also say regular point, yeah. So that's why it's written x rec here, yeah. But uh, I, you sometimes also say smooth point. One can maybe say that x is called smooth. if and only if x is equal to the set of regular points. So all the points of x are regular. So first, um, we really want that we really need that the ideal of x is equal to f, not just that uh, x is the zero set of f. I mean, for instance, uh, if I take the zero set of y squared in A2, so the variables x and y, this is just, you know, this is just zero set of y. It's just a line, and this is non-singular. Or, I mean, it's smooth. So it's called non singular or smooth. So it's non singular because if you take the derivative d by dy of this, this is 1, and this will not be 0 anywhere. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, if you do it for y squared, this at every point in the zero set of y, the, so d by, d, d by dx of y squared is always 0, and d by dy at every point where y is equal to 0 will also be 0. So you would, from this definition, you would get that every point of this is a singular point. But that's not true. Actually, every point is non-singular. Okay. We can look at some simple examples. If we take x equal to z of x minus I do it this way, y minus x squared. Then you can easily see that this, this is a, a conic, so a parabola. If you make the real picture, it somehow looks like that, so it looks kind of smooth. And indeed, you find that uh, uh, this is not singular. So all the points of it, so if you just take d by d by dy, this will always be 1. And uh, <coughs> well, this is 2x. So unless x and y are both 0, you know, anyway, you will, will see that this will work. Okay, this is a non singular variety. Well, so let's just look at, you know, you have for every point you have to check. So let's add to ch check at the point. So if, um, if I take d by dy, Yeah, and OK, and so it's non-zero. <laughs> no, but we don't need to show for x. We have to show that not all are 0. So it's a singular point if all the partial derivatives are 0. And so here, the first one is always non-zero, so it's completely trivial. OK? So uh, we can also look at x equal to the 0 set of y squared minus x squared times x plus 1. So this, is, we know, is a, a nodal cubic. So you somehow have a picture. So I always have the same examples, no? Because there are not so many examples which one can actually deal with explicitly. So, um, so it looks somehow like that. And you can see there is one point which looks uh, a little bit um, different, which is the point zero, zero. You know, when x and y are both zero, something happens. And this, uh, if you look at the real picture, you see really that you have two branches which intersect like that. So you would expect that this is a singular point, And you can easily check that uh, zero, zero is a singular point. Now if you just take d by dy, this will be 2y, 
and so it's zero when y is equal to zero and d by dx, well you can work this out, this is also obviously zero if y is equal, if x is equal to zero. And in the same way, for a cuspidal cubic, and you, so you can check that all the other points are non-singular, if you want. I mean, it's uh, some, yeah, it's the only singular point. And um, this would be the cuspidal cubic. You know that the picture is somehow like this. And we have, again, special point here, 0, 0. And we find, again, that uh, uh, 0, 0 is the only singular point. In fact, you I mean, can obviously see that this is a singular point. You have the one derivative is 2y, the other one is 3. What do you mean? No, this has one singular point. So there's only one. So, it's every, so if you take away the point, it's non-singular. But it's, it, is, it is singular. You call something singular if it has at least a singular point. <laughs> What? No, maybe please ask your question. Uh, okay, because um, I didn't get the clear. Uh, if uh, an hypercellus mm -hmm. has just, uh, for example, one, one singular point, yeah. can we call it, uh, and if the other points are not singular, yeah. uh, can we call the hypercellus non singular? No, it's called non singular if all the points are non singular. No? In fact, we will see in a moment that for any hypersurface, most points are non-singular. It's always an open, dense subset where it's not singular. So therefore, you know, you don't call something non-singular because it's almost everywhere non-singular. You call it non-singular if it is everywhere non-singular. No, it's sing yeah, no, it's singular if it is somewhere singular. Yeah. So otherwise, so it's called smooth if and only if x is equal to x rec. So if all the points are non-singular. It's called singular if there's at least one point where it's singular. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, and I didn't want to actually introduce this, but if you ask whether this is non-singular, no, it's not non-singular. It's non-singular only if it's everywhere non-singular. Otherwise, it would be. Um, and you know, and that. Yeah, this is non-singular. It's everywhere non-singular. But these two are singular. Okay, so let's, um, what? Ah, no, also, no, that was maybe a cuff. <laughs> it sounded like something. <laughs> okay, so um, now let me see. Now I want to prove that if I have an, a, an irreducible hypersurface, then it has an open, dense subset which is non singular. So then the, the set of non-singular points is open and dense. So the proposition. So let X in a N be an irreducible hypersurface. So the zero set of an irreducible polynomial, uh, then X rec is open and dense, which means the same as non-empty, but I write it to and dense in X. So you could say okay. So we have the want to see why this is true. So again, I'm a little bit cheating. I will assume for simplicity that the characteristic of our field is zero. Okay, 
So one can, again, look a little bit more carefully and see that uh, this, the proof works with minor modifications if, K is, if the characteristic is not zero. But uh, you know, I don't want to uh, take the trouble. So I just uh, will uh, assume the characteristic of K is zero. So we take uh, some polynomial f in, ir in k x1 to xn, of which is, is, so the polynomial of which it is the zero set, so uh, irreducible such that x is the zero set of f. So then we know that uh, the ideal of x is the ideal generated by f. No? It's a prime ideal. So now we can say, <clears throat> so maybe I call x sing to be the set of singular points of x. And now, if we remember the definition, I claim that the singular points of x, what are the singular points of x? These are the points of x where all the partial derivatives of f vanish. So the points of f of x are the zero set of f. And then we want also all the partial derivatives to vanish. So we take also. So it's this zero set. These are the singular points. And so <clears throat> obviously, this is a closed subset of x. So this is contained in x by definition, and it's closed in x. Because it, uh, it's the zero set of some more polynomials. So what we have to show is that, that the complement is, uh, is dense, which is the same as saying that the complement is non-empty. Because the complement is an open subset of an irreducible uh, of a variety. If I have an open subset of an irreducible variety, it's, it is dense, as long as it's not empty. Obviously, when it's empty, it's not dense. <laughs> OK? The sentence is a bit too long. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so so we have to show so the only thing we are left to show is that x is not equal to the single locus of x. Well, assume it is. So then we want to come to a contradiction. So <clears throat> you know that <clears throat> then I claim so the the ideal of all polynomials that vanish on x is the ideal generated by f. So <coughs> therefore, I claim that uh, you know, if x is equal to x sing, it follows that df by dxi, if I take the zero set of that, this uh, contains contains uh, x no because uh, if I take it the zero set should not become smaller by intersecting with it for all i for all i so in other words we have that the f by dxi is an element in the ideal generated by f 
for i. But now, if you think of it, this is more or less impossible because <coughs> dF by dxi has certainly a smaller degree than f. So how is it possible that something of a smaller degree is contained in an ideal generated by something? There's only one possibility, namely that this thing is zero. It follows that dF by dxi is equal to zero for all i. But uh, so now we use the characteristic zero. If the characteristic is non-zero, then you know there are some ways how this could actually be true, uh, which one then has to exclude. But if the characteristic is zero, then this implies that f is constant. And this uh, contradicts. I mean f. F is supposed to be a hypersurface, so it's a, it define a hypersurface, so it's a non, it must be a non-constant polynomial. Okay. So this was this. Yeah, I expect. Yeah, I, I expect it can also be generated to that, but. Uh, I now just, I mean, certainly we, yeah, I think with a bit more care, one can also do if, X, if it's reducible, but, uh, you know, okay, I, maybe that uh, you can think of as an exercise, but I think it can, yeah, it shouldn't be very difficult to generalize. I just was a bit lazy. Uh, ah. Okay. So this was for the moment everything I wanted to say about hypersurfaces. I <clears throat> now I want to talk about uh, tangent space for affine varieties. So the, the tangent space and singularity and non-singularity. Here I haven't talked about tangent space. We'll see in a moment that uh, what the tangent space was in, in this case. So one actually finds that according to the definition we are going to give, for a singular point, the tangent space will be the whole uh, of AN, okay, for a hypersurface like that. Um, but let's uh, do it. <laughs> okay, so let me see. <coughs> So, um, I mean, we are not going to get so far, but it is so that there's a big difference in difficulty between treating varieties which are non-singular and varieties which are singular. Okay, so many, so one of the reasons is that over the complex numbers, uh, a non-singular variety will be a complex manifold. So you can also, and in fact, so one can then also use differential geometry to study them, if one wants. But at any rate, many other methods of uh, also algebraic geometric methods depend, I mean, or become at least much simpler if uh, the variety is non-singular. So therefore, one wants very much to, you know, you know often wants to uh, restrict attention to non-singular varieties. So I, in, in my work, I very seldom encounter singular varieties because I, don't, <laughs> because I, I like to also use topological and uh, differential geometric tools. And so, um, <clears throat> so therefore, it is important to, uh, you know, to have to, to be able to talk about this. So, the, you know, also, for instance, if one studies homology and cohomology of these varieties, it's much easier to describe if they are non-singular. So, it, you know, related to, um, <clears throat> and so we, uh, if one, goes on in the study, one would uh, most of the time want to study non-singular varieties, develop special tools for that. And uh, we will actually at the end of this uh, lecture, we'll have maybe one or two lectures or one and a half about how this looks like for non-singular curves, that you somehow have a different way of describing the, the local ring of a non-singular curve. And this can be 
uh, used to study you know, many things about non-singular curves, which would be the last chapter of these notes, which we are not going to talk about, I think. But if uh, we did, one finds that, for instance, morphisms of non-singular curves have a much nicer description uh, because of uh, uh, the fact that they are non-singular and therefore the local rings of the non-singular curves have very special properties. So, uh, <clears throat> so there's really some, uh, I mean, it's, it is really quite useful. Then obviously if one is fearless, uh, later when one will also deal with singular things and there, there is a, anyway the, one cannot always avoid singularities, so one also has to study them and then you know, it's maybe important in order to understand things, then to understand what the singularities precisely are. And, you know, what the, so it's really, uh, I mean, it's really quite important for many things. I mean, it's not, uh, algebraic geometry is not only about classification. I mean, you know, to say when two things are isomorphic, that's a very coarse way of looking at it. Obviously, it's also true if uh, you have two varieties and, one is, and you have an isomorphism be, between them, then it must map non-singular points to non-singular points and singular points to singular points. So that also you can find uh, something about whether things can be isomorphic from looking at you know, singularities and tangent spaces. Okay. And you know, this is, as you can see until now, as compared to what we did about uh, uh, dimension, uh, somehow talking about tangent space and singular and non-singular is in some sense more elementary. You know, you have uh, actual concrete computations. The only thing why it comes afterwards is that, you know, the general definition of, of non-singular means that the dimension of the tangent space is equal to the dimension of the variety. So obviously you can only make sense of that if you know what dimension is. But uh, by itself dimension is in some sense more a more complicated to handle concept than, than this. Okay, so now we want to study the tangent space and of a fine algebraic set. So I also do it for a fine algebraic set. I don't necessarily assume uh, that things are irreducible because I don't need it. So <clears throat> let X in AN be in a fine algebraic set. And I want to define the tangent space. So first I define the def so definition. First I define the differential of a polynomial. So let F in K X1 to Xn be some polynomial, and I take P, a point, do I need the coordinates? Yeah, maybe, no. P, a point in AN. Uh, then I can look at the differential at P of F. So the differential of F at P is equal to the sum i equals 1 to n. I take the partial derivative at p, and then I multiply this. So this is just a number. No, I take the partial derivative, which is a polynomial. I evaluate it at p. This is a number. And I multiply this by xi. So this is a polynomial of degree 1, a linear polynomial. Uh, and therefore, it's, I can also view it as a linear map. So, and now the tangent space uh, to x at p. So, if p is a point in x. 
Again, the tangent space is only defined for points in X. You know? We don't define the tangent space to X at some point which does not lie in, in X. Um, <coughs> is uh, TPX, which is defined to be the zero set of all the differentials for F in EX. So you just take, so you take all the polynomials in the ideal of X and you take the differential at P. So you see therefore that TPX is a, you know, is actually a vector space. So it's a, in, it's a zero set of linear polynomials in AN, so it's a, you know, in a fine subspace of AN which goes through the origin, so it's just a vector space. And now, <clears throat> so P in X is called a non singular point. If the dimension of uh, this tangent space, you can either say that take the dimension as a vector space or also, also the dimension of a subvariety. This is the same because it's an affine space. The dimension of TPX is equal to the dimension of X at P. So what do I mean by that? I think I haven't introduced this. So the dimension of X of P is equal to the maximum of the dimensions of components, of irreducible components of X passing through P. Um, and otherwise, P is called a singular point. So um, in particular, if X is irreducible, then X is called a non-singular point if and only if the dimension of the tangent space at X is equal to the dimension of X. And I should also say uh, this actually is a bit misleading, namely if I have a non-singular point, then this will always lie only on one component. So one can show, but we cannot in the moment. And uh, I mean, it's a slightly more, it takes a bit of algebra which we haven't uh, developed. So can show that uh, if P in X is a non-singular point, then P lies only on one component of X. So if, if the point P lies on the intersection of two components, it's always a singular point. But it's not so, for hypersurfaces, you, uh, it would be an exercise to prove that. But uh, in general, it takes a bit of algebra. Okay. <coughs> And again, so we have x rec equal to the set of p non-singular points of x. And by xing is x set of singular points. And x is called smooth if uh, x is equal to x rec as before. So there's here, it's a little bit annoying that we have, so we have defined TPX to be the zero set of the differentials of all elements in the ideal of X. You know, that's very many polynomials. So that might not be very easy to check. But uh, so, <clears throat> therefore, uh, 
uh, we want to maybe have a way to use less, just take a set of generators of the idea. And this is a simple remark. Remark. So if the ideal of X is equal to the ideal generated by some polynomials F1 to FR, uh, then the tangent space of X is equal to the zero set of BP F1 BP FR. Okay? So you need to only take the generators. And this is a rather straightforward exercise. So maybe as we have the definition here, I can leave it there for a moment. <coughs> So by definition, obviously, the tangent space of X uh, is contained in this common zero set. Because uh, by the definition here, uh, the tangent set is the common zero set of all elements in the ideal of X, and these are certain elements in the ideal of X. So you have to prove the converse inclusion. Um, so, if H is an element in the ideal of X, so we can write it H equal to some uh, HI FI. So we can write it as a linear combination of the FI. <coughs> well, then if you look at the definition here of the differential, you can see from the definition that it will fulfill the product rule. I mean, the Leibniz rule, no? just uh, as a derivative always does. And this is done by derivatives. You find that um, you have a Leibniz rule uh, d p of f times g will be equal to dpf times g of p plus f of p times dpg. I mean, it's a you know, kind of exercise for uh, a very simple exercise to do this computation. <coughs> so we apply this here. So if we have dp h, this will be equal to sum i equals 1 to r, uh, dp h i times f i of p plus h i of p times dp f i. No? Now, <clears throat> the f i were supposed to be in the ideal of x, and p is a point in x. So, so p is in x, and fi is in the ideal of x. So fi of p is equal to 0. So this term is just not there. And then, so you see that this is a combination of the dpfi. So that means that if we, <coughs> instead of taking uh, just the, the, the dp fi, we take uh, uh, the dp of all these. These generate the same ideal. And so the zero set is also the same. <coughs> OK, do I need this? Yeah. OK, so I want to also, OK, so this is the definition. I also want to talk about the, 
Ah, so maybe I should, uh, as an example, now we have to see that our previous definition of uh, non-singularity somehow coincides with this one, no? So if um, uh, x is a zero set of f in a n plus one, and the ideal of f is equal to, uh, no, the ideal of x is equal to the ideal generated by f, then, <clears throat> so, so we have, um, there's only one f, no? So the tangent space of x will be equal to the zero set of dpf, no? And dpf is equal to the sum uh, i equals 1 to n df by dxi at p times xi. So uh, basically, so if, so this is a linear polynomial. So zero set has co-dimension 1, except, of course, is if this polynomial is zero. So we have either um, we have that df by dxi at p is equal to 0 for all i equals 1 to n. Then it follows that the tangent space of x at p is equal to the whole of a n. And this means that it, the dimension of it is not equal the dimension of the hypersurface is by definition n minus, is by our theorem n minus one. So, and thus P is a singular point. Or otherwise, uh, we have that at least one of these derivatives is non-zero, then the dimension of the, then we have indeed a hypersurface and so, or the, I mean, the, the tangent space is a hypersurface, and so it also has dimension n minus one. And p is not zero. Okay, and so we see that the uh, definitions do indeed coincide, and also what the tangent space is in this case. So now I want to say, just very briefly, if you have a, a morphism of a fine varieties, uh, then it also induces a map between the tangent spaces at the corresponding points. And this is given in terms of somehow the Jacobian of this map, which also I can write in terms of uh, differentials. So definition, so this is a bit like, you know, the second year of analysis. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I don't know why I wrote, I mean, it could have been a n plus one, but at least uh, afterwards I had decided it was a n. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the Jacobian. Of uh, F1 to FR in Kx1. R uh, is uh, the matrix n times n matrix. Uh, what is it? n times r times n matrix. So J of F1, FR, which is the matrix DF1 by DX1. 
1 until dfr by dx if 1 by dxn and here dfr by dx1 dfr by dxn so this is a polynomial Uh, so it's a matrix in this. So matrix with coefficients in this polynomial. And uh, maybe I should note just that you, if I, I mean, I can view uh, the differential at P as a linear map, no? so as a matrix. And so the matrix, so if I take the differential of, if I take the differential at P of F1 as a matrix, this is DF1 by DX1, comma, and so on, DF1 by DXN. So therefore, I see that um, I could also say that D P F1, uh, so for instance, if I take the zero set of D P F1, so dp f r, this will therefore be equal to the kernel of the Jacobian evaluated at p. Because it's just a different way of writing you know, df1. I can also write as a corresponding column here. So it's just Okay, so now I want to define the tangent map. Definition. So let x in n, y in M, so sub varieties, or so you don't need to. Well, maybe I don't actually need them to be irreducible, no, because uh, I have defined what a morphism or polynomial map between. Anyway, so let P be a point in X and Q a point in Y. And uh, let phi be a morphism from x to y. So I can write it as f1 to fm, x to y, where the fi are some polynomial in the variables on the source. And we assume. That phi of p is equal to q. So then, uh, I want to just say what the map on induced map on tangent vectors is. So the differential. of phi at p I can write it in two ways this is equal is uh, dp phi which is equal to dp f1 until dp fr and I claim this is a map from tpx to T, Q, Y. So, um, so by definition, D P phi you know, is just you, know, you I one can see the how that the coordinates on A N are in some sense in some way mapped to the coordinates of, of on A M. So is a map.
from an to am. And it's an easy exercise to show that it maps the tangent space of x to the tangent space of y. I mean, you just if you go through the definitions, it's basically obvious. So, but check, it maps tpx to tp y. And uh, as you can see here, as I just said in words before, you can also write this. Uh, if you want, instead of writing it in components like this, you can also write it as a matrix. And the matrix is just a Jacobian. So you can also write dp phi OK, this is this map. <laughs> and you can see that, um, I mean, just the obvious things that uh, if I take the, do this for the identity, then this is the identity. No, if you take the identity from x to x, it's easy to check that if you take the dp of uh, Psi composed with phi, this will be d uh, phi of p psi composed with d t phi, like you know, you learn also in analysis. And uh, so, thus, uh, if uh, phi is an isomorphism, then uh, dp phi from uh, tpx to t uh, phi of p y is an isomorphism of vector spaces or whatever. For all p in x. So this actually can be quite useful if you want to prove that something is not an isomorphism, it's enough to find one point where this tangent map, which is very easy to compute, is not an isomorphism. So, so this can be useful. So for instance, if we take our standard example, so um, so if again we take C to be the cusp per cubic cubic, so then we knew we had this nice morphism from uh, A1 to C, which was given by sending a point T in A1 to T comma T squared T to the 3. No? Now, then it follows that D, so if I take a point A in A1, D A phi will be uh, 2A. 3a squared. <coughs> and so we see that this tension map is actually the zero map at the point zero, zero. Okay. And it happens very often that when you have a morphism which is not an isomorphism, then either the, mor the morphism is not injective or the tangent map is not injective. I mean, I'm not saying it's if and only if, but if you want to check it in examples, it's uh, something you should check first, you know, instead of looking for more complicated ways. OK. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. They are not bringing more notes this time. What? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, you know, then, <laughs> no, no, it is, you know, we are also just starting, no? <laughs> I forgot my notes, so I have to, I don't know why. No, no, I mean, the beginning is quite easy, maybe because I decide to make it uh, easy in the beginning. <laughs> I mean, to start slowly. Okay. I don't know why I didn't bring it, but so let's, um, now this does it for the moment for the case of the fine varieties. Now I want to, in general, define the tension space, and I will give a completely different definition, which uh, is much more abstract, but it is intrinsic. So here we always have defined the tension space in terms of the equation of the variety. No, it's somehow... You know, the thing is somehow embedded in An and uh, uh, then given by some equation and we get the tension space somehow as a, in some sense, a subspace of this affine space. Now we want to uh, define the tension space in such a way that it is automatically, um, you can automatically see it only is invariant under isomorphism and you in, in fact you want to define it in terms of the local ring at the point. No, we have defined the local ring at the point, and in terms of that, we want to define the tangent space. This is uh, not so great in many cases if you want to do concrete computations, but it is for, for theoretical things, it's uh, much more powerful to have some intrinsic definition. So if you want to prove any kind of theorem, it's not so good with, uh, with such things. So uh, now, so make tangent space. And it is what generalize, generalizes best. Uh, for general varieties. So, so let's just uh, let a definition. Let X be a variety. I want to say what the tangent space is, and it's kind of strange. So we have the, I mean, it's uh, will be in terms of the local ring. So let OXP, so let P and X be a point. Um, so the tangent space. Uh, TPX is uh, TPX. It's the dual vector space, MP. You take MP, the maximal ideal, so P a point, and we should have written it, OXP, the local ring, and MP inside the local ring, the maximal ideal. So then the tension space is you take MP modulo MP squared. Now, MP is, a, you know, is an idea in here. MP modulo MP squared is a vector space. No? So it's, a, it's certainly a, a K vector space. And I take its dual. So if you I don't know whether you have encountered this in differential geometry. So one definition in differential geometry of the tension space is precisely that. You look at the functions, I mean the, con the differentiable functions in a neighborhood of P, modulo the differential functions in a neighborhood of P, so which vanish at P, modulo those which vanish, uh, modulo the square of those, and this is uh, one possible definition of the tangent space. So it is the same definition as in differential geometry, but no here in this algebraic setting. 
But I, you most likely you had another definition. I don't know. But there is a definition which looks precisely like that. Um, so to more explicitly, I could say this, this is all the, the linear maps. So k linear maps from, uh, well, this by definition, if it's a dual vector space, it's just from mp modulo mp squared to k. But it's, it might be more useful to say it uh, as linear maps from mp to k such that uh, maybe I call them v from mp to k such that v restricted to mp squared is equal to 0. No, obviously, that's the same thing. I mean, they are canonically identified. And then, you know, p in x is called non-singular. If tpx, the dimension of tpx, now this is, this is a vector space. So if the dimension of this vector space is equal to the dimension of x. And then we have the usual thing. No, you remember it's called singular if it's not. <laughs> so we have singular if, this is, if it's not non-singular. And we have uh, x, we have the singular locus and we have the regular locus. And if x is equal to x, we have x is equal to if x so we have said this three times today. So if x is equal to x reg, then x is called non-singular. Or smooth. OK, this is just the same kind of sermon each time. OK, so this is this definition. Now, um, this looks a bit. In the moment, it is maybe not even completely evident that this dimension has to be finite. No? We have this MP, which is a, you know, it's a some, uh, you know, some subspace of the, uh, of the local ring. The local ring is certainly infinite dimensional as a vector space. We divide by MP squared, so we don't know precisely what the, uh, and now we say that this will be regular if the dimension is equal to the dimension of x. So we don't in the moment even know whether it has finite dimensions. So that doesn't sound so great. But we will have to, to see that this will be OK. And um, <coughs> uh, if, for instance, x is an affine variety, a closed subvariety of a fine space, we have now two different definitions of the, of the tangent space. So they had better be equal. No? Yeah. Otherwise, uh, this is not OK. And. Um, so this is the, the first thing that we will uh, prove next time, that these are equal, which is a slightly tricky thing. But uh, I mean, not very, but you just have to set up the, the definition. <coughs> and uh, then, uh, then we will go on from there. And uh, we'll, I think, the next time also start talking about non-singular curves, I mean, the last bit. OK, thank you.